subscription platform and it utilizes a radically different, uh, radically different uh, technology from other multiplexing systems. Uh, we, we are able to analyze sample. Uh, our goal is to do all analysis in 15 minutes uh, with minimal sample prep. Uh, today I'm going to go over first how the technology works. Uh, secondly, I will then uh, highlight some of the key features that the system is capable of as a result of the novel technology that's being applied. And then how we're using that uh, towards developing products in autoimmune disease research, uh, but then also how it can be applied to other applications, both in cancer biomarker and other biomarker analysis isotype profiling, and then I'll touch on some of our uh, intentions around uh, the ability to uh, test for immunogenicity of biologics. So first, <coughs> on the left hand side here uh, is the actual instrument itself. Uh, I just point out that it has a quite uh, compact uh, footprint and is easily uh, mounted onto a uh, uh, lab bench. On the right hand side, uh, you can see a silicon chip. Um, these chips are the same kind of chips that are used uh, in uh, uh, cell phone and computers. Uh, they're made in a CMOS foundry uh, and use exactly the same type of processing. However, instead of moving electrons around the chip, what we use are actually, uh, we manipulate light. Uh, and so, uh, about 10 years ago, uh, a field was developed called silicon photonics, uh, and this technology has been developed and used routinely in the telecommunications space. We have adopted this process and the features on, this, uh, on these chips to be able to uh, detect surface binding uh, in a highly sensitive and responsive way. So we take robust standard biological assays and combine them with this photonic microchip technology to give you biology at light speed. So first of all, I want to introduce you to how this technology works. We have light which is introduced from a laser onto the chip and there uh, it is guided by waveguides to move around the chip. The light from the laser spans through uh, a spectrum of wavelengths. As the light goes from the laser, it is then uh, uh, directed to a detector which reads the energy from the light. As you read that through that spectrum, a ring resonator uh, is positioned adjacent to the waveguide. And as you scan through wavelength, there will be a discrete notch where the light uh, that is going down the waveguide jumps into the ring and will resonate. This uh, decrease in light is detected as a specific notch and we monitor that each individual sensor has a resonant frequency as the light is drawn into that ring. And as material binds onto the surface of the ring, the notch will shift. That shift is di directly proportional to the amount of material that binds. And so we come in, we can see materials binding onto the surface and as they bind, we can measure that difference in the overall shift, and that shift is directly proportional to the amount of material. So a way to perhaps envisage this is that uh, if you think of uh, an organ pipe, it will have its own specific frequency, and if you then paint, spray paint onto the surface of the organ pipe, that frequency will shift. In a similar similar vein, uh, as materials bind down onto our rings, we can measure that shift and we can measure it exquisitely. 
So we functionalize our sensors with a probe that can be an antibody or it could be a strand of DNA or it could be a protein epitope or it could be a lectin. And then as material flows across the sensors, as specific binding occurs, we can detect that and measure Uh, measure the mining occurring. So here is a, an example of one of our typical assays. In this particular instance, we've functionalized our sensors with an epitope. We first calibrate uh, the sensors and then flow sample. As sample flows across the sensors, there is binding of the uh, primary antibodies onto the surface. We then go through a wash step and then we come in with a signal amplification uh, which consists of uh, a mass tag attached to a, a, a secondary lig ligand. In the space of 15 minutes you get your result for all of the sensors in the system. And the results are highly standardized because the instrument uh, handles all of the robotic steps. Just to give you an orientation of the scale of this, on the bottom left hand side here is an image, uh, an EM image of uh, one of our sensors. They are 30 microns in diameter. And this ring, uh, if you were to uh, uh, look at its overall size, you could fit 10 of these onto the cross-section of a human hair. They're very, very small and this is uh, effectively utilizing the uh, uh, capabilities of the CMOS and CHIP uh, foundries where they can make uh, features down to nanometer specifications. Each ring is functionalized with a specific probe. We dedicate at least four rings to each individual probe that we're looking at so that we can create statistics um, so that there are multiple reads for each individual that, uh, each individual marker that you want to analyze. And then in terms of the chip platform itself, uh, we have this organized into either two flow channels or we can also have a single flow channel uh, where all of the sensors are exposed to a, sing, uh, to a single sample. Uh, so we can have one sample with up to 16 markers or two samples with eight markers on each chip. The chips are embedded in a disposable array and the array has a fluidics system which brings fluid across the chip. The fluid each individual microchannel only sees fluid for its specific sample and is used once and then is disposed of. I'm now going to start going through uh, the system's overall capabilities. We have a highly multiplex capability. Uh, we currently have 128 sensors on our chips. Uh, we have room to be able to scale up significantly beyond that. Our current throughput is two assay channels per chip, so you can do one to two samples per chip, and currently we have 16 markers. Um, towards the middle of this year we'll be coming out with a second generation where we will double that to 32 markers. In all cases the time to result is 15 minutes the workflow is standardized and for a full array which will be 24 samples uh, you, the, that can be analyzed in three hours uh, with only five minutes of hands-on time basically requiring the addition of sample. In addition to uh, the throughput of the individual instrument we also uh, have a series of expansion units so for each master instrument the laser is capable of driving eight 
uh, eight expansion units all at the same time. And so there is an expansion capability of eightfold beyond, uh, uh, beyond the first instrument. I'm now going to uh, start talking a little bit about the capabilities of the system uh, and what this technology can actually do. The system has a massive dynamic range uh, and part of this is due to the fact that when we take a read, rather than do a endpoint assay, we are actually measuring the rate of binding. And by measuring the rate of binding, which directly correlates to concentration, we are able to measure at high concentrations, and we are also able to measure at very low concentrations. As high concentrations, the on rate is determined very rapidly. At low concentrations, we generate a whole series of data points because we are interrogating the sensors on an ongoing basis, and we can in integrate this data over time to get a very reliable rate or slope of binding. In this particular case, we tested the system by functionalizing sensors with biotin and then coming in with different concentrations of streptavidin. And streptavidin binds uh, uh, with very high affinity to the biotin and therefore it goes on, it doesn't come off. You can see that at the high concentrations there's an initial very fast rate of binding and then it starts to plateau out. Uh, at lower and lower concentrations the slopes come down and at the lowest concentration, which was actually 60 femtomoles, uh, we were able in an eight minute period to integrate several hundred data points in order to get a very reliable slope so that if you were to try and measure this as a single endpoint assay, you'd be in the noise, whereas by integrating this data over time, we are able to extend the sensitivity down into, uh, to get a, a slope. Over here, we can demonstrate, we were showing that we demonstrated eight logs of dynamic range with a simple single binding assay. We're not limited to simply using a single binding assay though. Here, I want to show you data where we took uh, an antibody binding to a specific blood, blood associated protein. And in red, you can see the data generated where there was direct binding of the antigen to the antibody. So in this case, the antibody is the probe on the sensor and we're flowing antigen across and we can see that binding. We can employ all the tools of uh, sandwich ELISA type assays in order to, you, to incorporate a secondary antibody and that secondary antibody will not only increase the signal because of its inherent mass but as all, will also uh, as is well known, increase the overall specificity of the response. And so in this way, we can increase uh, and use all of the tools of robo robust assay development uh, on this system. We tried to push that a little bit further and we took an example of uh, an ELISA system. We used uh, the uh, antibodies from a well-established ELISA for TSH. And there we functionalized one antibody on the surface of the sensor. We then came in with different concentrations of TSH and then came in with a secondary antibody. Uh, in this particular instance, we had linked the antibody to a mass tag in such a way that we would enhance the overall signal as the secondary antibody bound to the antigen. And you can see uh, we were, in this particular case, able to generate sensitivities down to 4.2 picograms per mil. Uh, this was a performance which was better than the uh, uh, 
than the actual ELISA's performance. And the reason that it was better than the ELISA's performance was because we were actually able to monitor the rate of binding of the secondary and so push the overall sensitivity down into that, that range that goes beyond the uh, uh, sensing of an endpoint assay itself. So, we have a system which is scalable, is use, utilizes a small amount of sample, is easy to use, has a tremendous dynamic range, and is also uh, very sensitive. Where we are applying that are in a number of areas. First, we are introducing the system and a series of chips and products around autoimmune disease. Our very first launch was for uh, lupus and Sjogren's syndrome uh, in July of this of uh, 2012. We, I will also share some information for an active program that we have to address type 1 diabetes. Um, as an example of the ability to develop different assay systems, I'm going to share some information about bio, cancer biomarker detection. And then uh, I'll then turn to uh, uh, a new area that we're working on to develop isotyping capabilities. Uh, and this actually will use exactly the same chip platform and simply modify the workflow in order to be able to dig into the nature of the components that are binding on our chips. And finally, uh, I'll just touch on uh, the uh, potential for this system to be applied for immunogenicity testing uh, of biologics and recombinant materials. So this is our product portfolio uh, and new product launch plans. We have already launched ENA4 and ENA6 into the marketplace. Uh, we have a custom assay uh, offering so that if, individ if uh, groups are interested in being able to port the particular proteins or analytes of interest onto the system, uh, we can facilitate that. Um, a little later this year, we will be launching ANA11, uh, which is a full lupus panel. And around the same time, uh, we will be launching an isotyping, isotype profiling uh, test kit, which will be applicable to all of the different uh, uh, chip products that we have available. Uh, type 1 diabetes is progressing very well, and I'll share a little bit of data on that. And then down the road, we also have intentions for uh, rheumatoid arthritis, antiphospholipid syndrome, uh, and irritable bowel disease type applications. So our first product, ENA6, has been developed for uh, uh, the six markers uh, associated with Sjogren's disease. Uh, and if you look at the data that we generated here, uh, I'm showing uh, a curve where we've taken our data in terms of uh, response units and compared that with the ELISA data. In every case, you can see that there's an extremely good correlation. Uh, this is a response which is uh, robust and uh, uh, with whole serum, uh, we're able to see a very uh, uh, a reliable result uh, through not only standardized materials uh, but also a, a series of uh, test uh, clinical samples as well. We were very encouraged by the robustness of this system and so we actually decided to test whether we could use whole blood in the same system um, and what we found is that not only can we get data which is directly comparable with both ELISA and our serum data, but that whole blood, either from EDTA blood, citrate, or heparin uh, anticoagulant treated blood, all perform very well in this system. This really speaks to the uh, robustness of the system uh, and the fact that these assays are very well suited for uh, 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 for, for rapid and robust analysis. I'm now 
I'm going to tell you a little bit about the work we're doing in type 1 diabetes. Uh, recently we secured a grant uh, to develop a multiplexed assay for type 1 diabetes. Uh, this is a, a sevenplex assay. Uh, we are collaborating with the Barbara Davis Center for Childhood Diabetes. Uh, and the intention is to be able to not only profile uh, these different epitopes uh, and see and see the uh, uh, see the autoimmune response to those specific antigens, but but also be able to profile uh, the nature of those antibodies binding, uh, and so develop patterns for clinical uh, management and pro uh, monitoring of progression of disease. In in the space of two months. Uh, we have been able to develop uh, an assay uh, which seems to be extremely robust. We're very pleased with the performance so far. Uh, we haven't uh, used clinical samples yet, but using normal human serum spiked with antibodies to each of the antigens targeted and comparing that with unspiked serum you can see that there's a very robust response for each of the specific antigens which are being targeted in this assay. So we feel that uh, uh, over the space of a short period of time we've been able to develop this assay um, and we are looking forward to uh, uh, developing it for further analysis. I'm now going to give you an example of a different type of assay. Uh, this is some work that we did uh, last year on cancer biomarkers. And here we're using an immuno format. So you have antibody to your specific ant uh, at cancer antigens on the sensor rings. You then flow serum across and you'll get binding of the specific antigen to its antibody. And then you come in in a standard sandwich, sandwich ELISA type format with a secondary to see binding. One of the key features of our system is the fact that we can very rapidly develop assays based on the nature of the workflow. We can take a chip and we can functionalize with a whole selection of different antibodies from different sources and we can test those in all pairwise combinations. So not only can we Put, deposit those antibodies onto the surface, we can then confirm that the deposition has occurred because we can actually monitor what's happening to the rings uh, without any destruction of the assay itself. We, it's a real-time assay so we can actually monitor what's happening. We can see that the antibody is down on the surface. We can then confirm whether the antibody is actually binding its target ligand and then we can test in all pairwise combinations the secondary antibody coming in to see whether it binds, how well it binds, uh, and how robust a response it, it provides. Using this format, uh, we've been able to test uh, and analyze a series of uh, cancer biomarkers in a short period of time. Uh, and this is just a, an example of uh, a few of those markers where uh, we're able to detect in serum at uh, clinical levels uh, for each of these markers. Isotyping is uh, a particular area that we're interested in. Um, once you have generated uh, your chip, you can modify the workflow in order to look at different features of the binding interactions that are occurring. So when someone uh, uh, is presenting an autoantibody response, there are a whole series of different antibodies uh, that are included in that mix. It's a polyclonal response and you will have IgGs, IgAs, IgMs, uh, different subtypes of the uh, antibodies all binding as potential, potential binders. What we can do, and this is a stylized uh, graph uh, figure to show, show the binding events, is you have the antigen as the probe on the, on the sensor. 
you then flow serum across and you will get binding of different classes of antibodies onto those antigens. So there can be IgGs, IgAs, IgGms. What we then come in with is we then flow a biotinylated isotype specific anti-human antibody which will bind to a subset of the antibodies binding onto the surface of the, uh, of the antigens. And then we come in with a amplification bead which is, has uh, streptavidin so that it will bind to the, uh, uh, to the biotinylated probe. When we do this for a, a sample, what you can see is you get a profile of the different antibody types binding to each specific antigen. So here we have an example of Joe, uh, which has a very high amount of uh, binding of IgM, whereas uh, with Smith RMP, uh, there is a dramatically different profile. So using this type of approach, we're able to take uh, uh, we're able to take the uh, profile for each antigen uh, and see which subtypes of antibodies are binding to them. Uh, all of these are achieved again in 15 minutes. Uh, with minimal hands-on time. The exact same process can be, um, is repeated for not only the uh, isotypes IgM, IgG and IgA, uh, but we will also be developing uh, uh, to be able to do subtypes of the IgGs as well. Next, um, I'm going to just touch on the testing of immunogenicity. So immunogenicity of recombinant proteins is a significant issue uh, in the clinical space where uh, people are now being treated with uh, biologics. And those biologic therapeutics uh, in, for some patients uh, can produce a, an immune response uh, which compromises the efficacy of the drug. In order to analyze type of, uh, uh, this type of response, we can adapt our system with a view to being able to not only detect that there is an immune response against the drug, but also we can actually uh, segment to the different isotypes of antibodies that are binding to that drug. Uh, in this particular case, uh, the way that we approach that is that we have the, each ring functionalized with antibody which will bind to specific isotypes. So in this particular instance, we're looking at uh, a ring which is functionalized with an anti-IgG. So all of the IgGs will bind to the surface of the ring. And then we can incubate a sample with drug which, which has a biotin associated with it. And any antibodies that are binding to the drug uh, will, will uh, then become tagged with the biotin marker. These, if, cap if, they, if they capture onto the ring, will then uh, be available to bind to streptavidin coated beads to give a re uh, an amplification response. And so in this way, we believe that we're going to be able to not only determine uh, the binding of a particular, uh, the, the binding of antibodies to the drug, but also uh, that we'll be able to subtype those through the uh, signal generated with the streptavidin bead. So, having looked at the different various applications and ways, we'll choose Maverick. So, it is a uh, highly flexible system with great 
multiplexing capability. You get a tremendous amount of data from a very small amount of sample in a, much, a rapid period of time um, uh, and we will be continuing to expand the amount of data that can be generated over time. Uh, you get statistics um, and uh, 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 a, a precise quantitation of the amount of material that's binding for your particular analytes. In terms of workflow, uh, this is unparalleled in terms of simplicity. Basically, the researcher adds sample to a 96 well plate, inserts the cassette and a thumb drive which captures all of the information and also has all of the assay information associated with the recipes. The instrument then does everything else. This means that it's highly standardized uh, and the potential for user error is completely minimized. Uh, if you look at the saving in terms of effort, sample and time, there is a, a, a significant saving through, across the board for this particular use. And perhaps most importantly, uh, the system has no crosstalk. Uh, each sensor is independently linked through its waveguide. And the sensor that it, it detects is discreetly within uh, a few hundred nanometers of the actual ring itself. And so there is no possibility for crosstalk between rings. This is quite different from some of the fluor fluorescent type technologies where there, there can be significant crosstalk arising. In this particular case, there is no crosstalk possible with the system. So finally, uh, why choose Maverick? We're summarizing that you have uh, four data points, 32 markers per chip, results in 15 minutes, no sample prep. Uh, it's a highly automated protocol uh, and no crosstalk. In terms of uh, products and services that we're providing, uh, we uh, currently have the Maverick M24 and expansion units which allow uh, at, uh, uh, at a lower price to expand the system uh, for increasing throughput. Uh, we have our initial launch of products into lupus and Sjogren's disease. Uh, we'll be continuing with type 1 diabetes, RA and irritable bowel disease. Our isotyping uh, workflow will be launching um, uh, soon this year. Uh, and down the road, we anticipate to uh, uh, be working validating the isotyped immunogenicity uh, offering. Finally, on the services side, we, we offer a whole series of different levels of service. We can custom chip spot. Uh, we can develop assays and we can validate assays all the way through to a full service offering. Um, uh, and we welcome uh, the opportunity to uh, discuss these, uh, these services uh, as people have specific project areas that they want to develop. So finally, I'll pass it back to Chris. Uh, we will be attending the uh, SLAS uh, conference in uh, Florida and we'll be exhibiting there, so we uh, certainly uh, uh, hope to be able to see you there as well. Uh, I'll pass it over to you now, Chris, and thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Martin. We have a few minutes left here, uh, so we'll take a few of the questions. Um, first question is, can I choose which antigens are on the chip? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, uh, this is uh, just a question of uh, determining uh, what you want on the chip and there are several approaches to, be, to, to achieve this. First, as I mentioned, we have a custom, off, custom uh, spotting service. Uh, we also have a broader scope service where we can have technical transfer so that if a group uh, want to be able to have absolute control over what they put on the chips and keep that as a proprietary 
uh, issue, then we can actually transfer the technology so that they can do their own spotting. And finally, we have a universal chip. This is a self-assemblier chip uh, where one can uh, inflow have uh, tagged uh, proteins or antibodies uh, self-assemble onto specific sensors. So this could be a, uh, an easy uh, test system for people to be able to validate their specific uh, experimental questions. Great. Uh, okay, next question is, what is the throughput of the system? So, uh, using our 32 analyte chip, you can run two samples of 16plex uh, on one chip in 15 minutes. A uh, full chip array would give you 16 data points uh, times 24 samples. That's uh, 384 data points in three hours, so uh, just over uh, 120 per hour. Uh, and then each expansion unit beyond that uh, will increase the throughput by an equivalent amount. And again, there's no babysitting or uh, hands-on time is minimal really. You can just set this up, uh, load it into the instrument and walk away and the uh, instrument will handle everything else. Great. Um, last question as we're coming to the end of our time here. Is the Maverick only capable of detecting proteins or can it detect DNA or RNA? Uh, we actually have uh, uh, some ex extensive amounts of work which has been done uh, on both DNA and RNA. We have some publications describing both SNP analysis and direct monitoring of microRNAs from uh, cell extracts. Uh, this has been published. Um, and if uh, I didn't speak about it today, but if uh, there's anyone interested in that side of things, we'd be happy to uh, uh, talk about our capabilities around those uses. Great. So uh, thanks, Martin, for the presentation and answering the questions. Uh, folks, that's all the time we have today. If we didn't get to your question, we will send you an email shortly with an answer. Uh, also, please feel free to contact me directly if you have any additional questions, and I can put you in touch with Martin or whoever we need to at Genelite to address your question fully. My contact information is shown here on this slide down at the bottom. And also, if any of you are attending SLAS next week, please stop by and visit us at booth 738 and or attend our vendor tutorial and late night with LRIG sessions on Monday night. Thank you again for joining us today, and we look forward to talking with you again soon.